So thank you very much for this presentation. I was not only a friend, but I was a really a fellow of Michele Baccarani for many years, so it's my pleasure. Although 15 minutes to talk about the history of chronic myelogenous leukemia, it's a little bit tight, I would say. So uh, going very fast, I think that uh, certainly we can affirm that uh, CML holds a revealed number of research and clinical records. And the story started uh, in the middle of the 1800s when uh, two people described in Berlin, uh, Rudolf Virko and in Edinburgh, uh, John Hughes, described a case uh, in which there was an enormous expansion of the white blood cells in the, in the blood, similar to the one represented in the teaser slide, which was giving a purulent aspect to the blood. And they therefore decided to call this event the leukocytemia, and that's the basis for the start of the name leukemia that we have in present days. We have to jump over approximately one century when, in 1960, um, Peter Nowell and Hagenford in Philadelphia described a small chromosome uh, which was uh, a marker uh, present in uh, most of the cases of chronic myelogenous leukemia. But uh, the person who described it exactly from the cytogenetic point of view, Jeanette Rowley, uh, indeed uh, took advantage of the fact that, that there was the bending technique. And then through bending technique, it was uh, uh, seen that uh, the, small, the small chromosome 22 here was indeed the results of a translocation, balanced translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. So going very fast, we can say that uh, after the discovery of chromosome uh, Philadelphia and the, the translocation established, indeed we have to, another gap of approximately 25 years, in which uh, uh, till reaching the middle of the 80s, uh, when uh, John Groffen, as well as uh, with uh, Nora Easterkamp and others, indeed uh, described the genomic rearrangement, which was responsible for um, or present or corresponding to the cytogenetic abnormality, the BCR Abelson fusion on chromosome 22, most cases on chromosome 22, and uh, indeed Emma Stevelman and Deli Kanani at the same time uh, uh, were able to describe the fusion between BCR and Abelson gene, maintaining the uh, in frame uh, Eberson uh, tyrosine kinase uh, part, which was uh, leading to the uh, expression of a, a fusion uh, PCR protein, PCR Eberson, this was uh, described by Konopka in the Owen Whitty lab in uh, UCLA, and that this was uh, uh, corresponding to the presence of a constitutive tyrosine kinase activity. Of course, uh, that this was really responsible for the leukemia was a notion achieved only later when George Daly in the David Baltimore uh, lab in Boston uh, indeed was able to insert the bcr uh, fusion within a retroviral vector infecting uh, hematopoietic progenitors and giving rise to a phenotype uh, which was similar to chronic myelogenous leukemia in human, although not totally uh, similar, but quite similar. So the counterproof counter of this, uh, this fact was obtained only later by a very important uh, guy in the history of CML, uh, Brian Drucker, who indeed in 1996, exactly in Jerusalem, in a congress in which I was uh, happy to be present, organized by uh, Elisier Rachmilovitz, indeed uh, established that uh, and by putting, by suppressing the bcr Ibsen activity uh, using a compound which was able to shut off the tyrosine uh, kinase activity, indeed uh, this was affecting the bcr Ibsen signal cells, but positive cells, but not the normal progenitors. This was the start of the molecular targeted therapy, not only for CML, but now we are quite used to use uh, compounds which are able to, of course, uh, uh, target a specific molecular defects. But this, this was a very, very fundamental first example. And uh, so, as a general overview, uh, of course, many, many papers were published trying try to establish 
the BCR Ableton activation together with uh, the uh, pathways which were involved in uh, giving origin to the proliferation in, in uh, changing the uh, stromal, uh, the addition to the stromal layer and in inhibiting the apoptosis. And so there are many, many different, uh, I would say, uh, pathways which are activated and this has been dissected in a huge number of papers, uh, but of course, uh, just it's very difficult to to pinpoint uh, every one uh, of these. But the main aspect is certainly represented by the activation of BCR Abelson, and that's why. Uh, there is also another effect which is very, very important. In the, uh, this is just an example of how maybe it's possible the table source is contributing also to the genomic stability. And this in a, the, the function of the normal Abelson being activated that leads to a, a genomic instability also produced by the reactive oxygen species and so on. And this is causing, of course, uh, the fact that uh, there is generation, a continuous generation of new subclones, uh, which are finally, let's say, uh, blasting in a sort of uh, acute leukemia, which is called the blast crisis, and that did indeed is uh, the cause of the deaths of most of the patients in, uh, I would say, uh, during the past years. So, uh, unfortunately, we have not yet established which are the, uh, there is not a single pathway to blast crisis. There are many pathways which are, can be activated, so it's very difficult, let's say, to affect or to hit uh, these uh, pathways uh, with a single drug or a single, uh, and what we have to do is just to try to destroy the clone uh, to preventing its uh, uh, evolution and therefore as soon as uh, uh, we can perform an early diagnosis or the very early step of its uh, progression. The progression, however, is ending in a blast phase, as you say, uh, and uh, in, uh, it was observed already many years ago that in 20, 30 percent of the cases, this is a lymphoid blast crisis, which means that the original target of uh, the BCR Abelson rearrangement was, was a, a totipotent uh, pH positive stem cells, which uh, maybe is not, however, uh, the first uh, affected stem cells, but there is, a, a, I would say, a more uh, higher progenitor, uh, which can be unstable and can have a, a clonal expansion, similar to what has been described now with the uh, cheap clonal hematopoiesis of uh, an undetermined significance. And you, uh, this may be really the cause of other defects which are maybe present in the so-called normal hematopoiesis on the same subject. And um, so the big question is, uh, is the genomic instability of the pH positive clone the key factor for progression, or is the BCR Abelson rearrangement the cause or a consequence of this instability? At the moment, we are still dealing with this uh, aspect, with, but it's certain that uh, once we, that we achieve a complete cytogenetic remission, there are cases uh, with a percentage which is not irrelevant, 5-7%, that uh, have uh, other uh, uh, abnormalities from the chromosomal point of view. Even from the molecular point of view, using NGS and other methods, we have uh, molecular uh, clonal expansions. Therefore, in some cases, few, for, for, uh, fortunately, few. Indeed, uh, we have also the evolution of the disease in a pH negative uh, malignancy, myeloid like MDS or acute myeloid leukemia. But um, the problem is that uh, this is uh, something that we have still to solve as a uh, and now, uh, in a quite recent paper, again, uh, Susan Branford and this group, and their group, indeed, uh, decided uh, to explore more uh, this aspect using NGS and other molecular uh, investigation. So, from the clinical point of view, the history of CML, uh, this justifies the title, uh, From the Nightmare to the Cure. 
uh, started with, uh, I would say, it was impossible to stop the progression of the disease. And the blast crisis uh, was generally observed in approximately uh, with a, a time of three, four years from the time of diagnosis. So some cases maybe almost immediately, in other cases with a longer um, chronic phase. But um, it was observed that with conventional treatment, which means uh, in some cases also experimental treatment like radiation or like chemotherapy or like uh, arsenics was also used, indeed uh, achieving hematological remission was not enough. There was a little change in the time of progression in these cases. I would say the initial revolution started when it was demonstrated that the interferon half as well as allogenic bone marrow transplantation, suppressing or eradicating in some case also the pH positive clone was associated with a longer survival of the patients. The interferon alpha was, uh, however, active only in a rather small percentage of patients in approximately 30% of the cases, and the rest were not achieving a good cytogenetic remission, were bound to progress. And this was uh, indeed uh, a good work of the Italian study group on uh, CML, uh, led by uh, Psantetura and Michele Baccarani. So uh, this was the establish, uh, to, in fundamental to establish the achievement of a good cytogenetic and molecular remission, uh, so to achieve what at the time was uh, uh, called PCR negativity, uh, was associated with increased survival in CML. And the big revolution, however, started in, uh, in the new uh, millennium when, uh, and this is uh, witness uh, by witness, but it is uh, uh, cover of the Time magazine in 2001, in which uh, uh, imatinib, the same drug that was described in preclinical studies by Brian Drucker, indeed was uh, shown uh, to be able to suppress in vivo uh, the pH positive uh, cases uh, in patients who were resistant uh, to interferon in a very dramatic way. This paper was published by the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001-2. So, and uh, uh, in 2001 was also the year in which uh, uh, officially hematinib was uh, registered and approved and registered for the treatment of CML, thanks uh, to the results of this study, the IRIS studies, uh, that is showing after uh, 10 years a survival of the patients uh, which is uh, around 80%. So there is very difference, uh, slightly difference between the, the, um, what can be obtained with imatinib and apparently with the interferon alpha, but uh, most of the patients after a few months were switched to receive the imatinib. So these are all imatinib treated uh, patients and the survival is a little bit more than 80%. Uh, of course, after imatinib, we had harder uh, TKIs. Uh, so imatinib was the first, but then we had nilotinib, dazatinib, bozutinib, and ponatinib uh, was, uh, can be used as second-line therapy when there is a 359 mutation. It's a third line, uh, bozutinib, ponatinib, and the new um, drug which is uh, uh, approved now and will be registered soon even in Europe, which is Ashinimib, uh, which is a very good uh, third line uh, option. And uh, um, we have also, however, many other investigational uh, drugs uh, which are in treatment. And this, yeah, I would like to say that uh, Ashinimib is not only one more addition, but it's opening a new uh, road because it's able to bind a non the traditional sites where most of the TKIs are um, binding, the ATP binding pocket, but the reminiscent So it's a new category of TKI which can complement its action uh, very well with uh, the uh, other traditional TKIs. So we expect that in combination therapy, this uh, uh, compound will be able to uh, produce even better results than to um, use alone. And now uh, the survival of CML patients little by little increases, you may see. And uh, now I think that probably we can expect an overall survival in our days even better than what represented in the slide at 10 years of approximately 90%. So there is still a gap that we have to fulfill, certainly, but this gap is really limited. 
In the meanwhile, we have learned to monitor strictly the patients. So this is probably the best example of the um, personalized therapy of the patient uh, tailored therapy, in which we have uh, able to monitor with RQPCR and the study of the mutations which can occur and can confer resistance to some TKIs, all the patients. And what you have learned that could to go lower and lower in terms of residual disease is always better. And we, we have seen that many other diseases now are uh, having this kind of approach. And um, uh, Still, the fact that uh, at the end of the day, uh, once that we achieve a, a deep molecular response for a certain period of time, not necessarily a PCR negativity, but uh, at least a reduction of four or five lux with respect uh, to what is presented diagnosis, some of the patients can also discontinue the TK therapy without uh, uh, undergoing a relapse or a molecular resistance of the disease. And this is the results of the STEAM-1 uh, study, which was the first one, that is showing a very long follow-up of patients that for now more than seven, eight years, even ten years, I think, uh, have not experienced any more relapses. So we can think that these uh, cases are really cured, uh, although in an operational way. So the next goal of CML therapy, in which we have to work uh, hardly, I think, uh, in the next uh, Yes, will be just to move from the achievement of a good overall survival that in, not completely, but in, I would say in most part has been achieved already to a treatment free remission that at the end of the day really represent the cure of the patients of the disease. And so it is, uh, it will help us to understand the biology of leukemia in general, not only of chronic semiologous leukemia, so I'm sure that this research will add also uh, to a very important uh, results uh, for other myeloid malignancies, but not only, probably other malignancies in general. Thank you very much for your attention.